Now, Jeff. if this conference really lacked something, um, it lacked philosophy, epistemology, and uh, philosophy of the mind, I think we now get it all. Uh, I have the honor to introduce you, Professor Dr. Thomas Metzinger. He is a Jung Fellow at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies and co-founder of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. So, thank you, Thomas Metzinger. Send your questions to the email address that you know, and we'll have a discussion after the two presentations. What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So let me add another discipline to the mix. How many philosophers are in this room? Oh, wow. So I predict there will be more in the future, and you will probably hate it. Um, <laughs> before I start, uh, I want to draw attention to the wider context of um, the work we've been doing in the last three days and in this uh, research community. There's this concept uh, I invented many numbers of years ago, which has had an enormous um, uh, career. How many of you remember um, the European, this Europäische Kollegium für Bewusstseinsforschung? Ah, this is fewer people, but still like 10. So, um, Bewusstseinskultur means, the definition is, that one develops an ethical stance toward one's own mental state. That is, one doesn't ask what is a good action as in classical ethics, but one also asks what is a good state of consciousness in the normative sense, that one then systematically cultivates valuable states, and that one works towards a rational evidence-based enculturation of these states. This is not such a new idea. Um, in Roman antiquity, there was this idea, cultura autem animi, philosophia est, and as you may know, philosophers think about many things, they like, also like to think about what philosophy actually is. So we have journals that are called Metaphilosophy, where philosophers only write papers about what philosophy is, and that it's an old tradition. So there, uh, the definition of what it means to love wisdom, to be a philosopher, was taking care and cultivating the soul. And uh, I think that historical motive is still very much alive today in our work. So, this talk has a very simple structure, a first part in which I just want to briefly give you five examples of why psychedelic research is interesting for philosophers today. And <clears throat> in the second part, I want to talk a bit about cultural embedding. I want to disappoint you, hopefully, by explaining to you why I am against legalization. Uh, and I will talk about it the process by which uh, states of consciousness and new technologies uh, can become embedded into culture a bit. And I want to offer you five first building blocks towards such a process. But here are just five examples why philosophers find psychedelic research interesting. A project is to isolate the neural correlate of consciousness. So here you see a book I've edited uh, in 2000, MIT Press, Neural Correlates of Consciousness. This is a research program that many people follow in an academic society called the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness, which I have found 22 years ago. Here you see the man who 
won probably the most famous uh, Nobel Prize, Francis Crick and German Christoph Koch, who have been big proponents. But it's important to understand this research program was conceptualized by philosophers, not by neuroscientists. So here you have the definition of what an NCC really is. It's a minimal neural system N, such that there is a mapping from states of N to states of consciousness, where a given state of N is sufficient under condition C for the corresponding state of consciousness. Philosopher David Chalmers, and the important point is that word minimal. That is, we look for that set of neurofunctional properties that reliably enough determines a state of consciousness by which you cannot make smaller anymore. So, obviously, for philosophers interested in a research program like this, there's a lot in current psychedelic research that is directly relevant. For instance, if you're interested in the neurocorrelate and minimally sufficient conditions for selfhood, Hans was just talking about it, for ego dissolution. But of course, today we don't talk about neural correlates anymore. Um, we are interested in what the information flow in the neural correlate actually does. So you heard in Timo's talk, there was this new concept introduced into uh, science uh, on this conference, phenoconnectomics. But from a philosophical perspective, the question is, what is the relevant level of functional granularity? That is what philosophers are interested in. They're not interested in neurons and they're not interested in global firing patterns. The question is, what is the right level of computational analysis? Second example, the phenomenology of ego dissolution. Why is that important? Because the self is the origin of the first person perspective. So as you may or may not know, <clears throat> I've been working on a theory of consciousness for more than 25 years. I have this research program. I'm not going to say a single um, sentence about this, but I want to draw your attention to another fact that you may not be so aware of. Here are three philosophical papers out of 2017 all written by truly excellent, internationally well-known philosophers. Now, what do all these philosophers at universities in Australia, England, what do they have in common? <coughs> they have in common that they read the latest psychedelic research and find it highly interesting for their own philosophical theorizing. So, there is a stronger crosstalk actually emerging. Let's look at a third example why psychedelic research is important for philosophers. This gradient is between trend, transparency and opacity. So this is a famous philosopher who in a paper in 1903 um, <coughs> introduced the concept of transparency. And I'm going to briefly explain to you what it means. This famous thinker, Dean Moore, said it seems that consciousness as itself is transparent or diaphanous. <coughs> so the thing is we can experience these things in normal conditions, but the consciousness of it all, many people think at least, is not a part of your experience. For instance, most of you, your visual representation of this lecture hall gives you the feeling of being in immediate contact with it. You all have this experience of sitting in a lecture hall right now, which is of course false, right? This is a controlled online hallucination, uh, if you look at the best mathematical models of brain functions we have right now. There are no colored objects in front of your eyes. Colors are properties of models of objects the brain uh, constructs. Philosophers say a representation, a conscious representation, is transparent if you cannot uh, experience it as a representation. Then you are a naive realist. So the definition would be it's a functional property of conscious representations active in the brain. Unconscious representations are neither transparent nor opaque. 
But interestingly, some conscious states, for instance, pseudo hallucinations, are not transparent. If you see a breathing moving pattern on the wall, you know that this is mind dependent and not external reality. You know that this is probably a misrepresentation. You experience it. Now, this is an old theoretical problem, but psychedelic experiences are extremely interesting because you can influence the gradient between transparency and opacity, between realness and mad. This is unreal. You know, and uh, you all know what I'm talking about. There are opaque states and the transitions can be studied. And to put it in a nutshell, if my theory is right, opacity results when the construction process of a model in the brain becomes introspectively accessible. Then you can experience the constructive nature of it all. If that is true, um, psychedelics are a very important tool for philosophers. Modal knowledge and epistemic innocence. This young man we see here has written the first philosophical dissertation, doctoral dissertation, uh, on psychedelics in a long time. And he says there are three distinct kinds of knowledge, distinct kinds of knowledge. Knowledge by acquaintance of the subject's psychological potential. That means through psychedelic experiences you learn what is possible and what is not necessary in your own mind. And as many people in this room know, there's a lot to learn there. Then there is um, of the metaphysical nature of the sense of self, namely that there is no such thing as a self, and capacities for the acquisition of modal knowledge. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but the point is that psychedelic research is of great interest to modern philosophical epistemology. Is there a distinct kind of knowledge in these states? And how would we justify it? Now, there's a technical concept of epistemic innocence. I'm going to briefly explain that. It says the idea that delusion or confabulation may have psychological benefits is familiar. Everybody knows that in psychiatry. What is novel and interesting is the idea that such conditions may also yield significant and otherwise unavailable epistemic benefits. So the idea is that by losing knowledge and insight, by being confused in a certain domain, you may actually gain more knowledge in the overall process in a larger time window. So this philosopher Lisa Bortoletti says that not only for psychiatry patients, but for other people as well, there may be just no other uh, alternative available for certain epistemic processes than to become delusional. And still it's a process in which knowledge grows. So, um, these are examples where best cutting-edge technical philosophers find great interest in psychedelic states. My last example are semantic hallucinations and phenomenal intentionality. So, I guess almost everybody in this room knows Kathleen Breller's paper, which discussed a lot about it yesterday evening, but from the perspective of the philosophical, the conceptual policemen, there are actual conceptual problems. So what actually is personal relevance as a construct in empirical studies? What actually does it mean that the experience of meaning goes up and down or is increased during these states? From a philosopher's perspective, sentences have meaning, concepts have meaning, Experiences don't have meaning. It's a metaphorical use. What is it actually that um, determines the phenomenology of these states where suddenly there is increased meaning and personal relevance? So you may know 1874, one of the philosophers who founded empirical psychology 
that there, there is something like intentionality that has to do with meaning. That mental states are always directed towards something outside of themselves. There is a meaning relation. The interesting question is now, how does the brain model this meaning relation? Something has a meaning to me. I have a state that has a content that is directed at something. The only thing I want to say is that there is a lot of existing work in philosophy of mind concerning the conscious experience of being meaningfully directed at some object component. So the idea would be that there is a phenomenal model of the intentionality relation in the brain. I'm not going into any details here, but there's a dynamic model of being meaningfully um, related to parts of the world, but what makes Katrin Keller's study, for instance, is interesting is that other people have theorized that there is an internal model of the process of successfully integrating self with object representations, but that this research shows that this model can be hallucinated. We can hallucinate meaning just like psychiatric patients can. We can also, like depressive patients, um, can lose the experience of meaningfulness completely. So if that's true, then subjective meaning attribution is a locally determined representational process in the brain. And these studies show an empirical root into that, and that is interesting for philosophers. So these are the things I would really like to talk about. Um, but I'm the idiot who has to give the last talk of this conference, uh, so I'll have to talk about something else. Maybe if there can be something like a practical philosophy in mind as well. So the topic was, can there be a protocol for phase two in culturating psychedelic experiences? So the first question you might have was, why does this guy talk about phase two? What he, what does he mean by phase two? Let us keep things very simple and look at just one molecule molecule of LSD. Phase 1 began on April 16, 1943. That's when the first human being inadvertently had an LSD experience. Millions of people have taken LSD since then. There's an illegal, illegal market, supply chains, there's an industry, a small scale industry. There's a stable subcultural context. People know how to handle these things. There is subcultural knowledge about risk and harm reduction, about dosage, and so forth. And there is a low but stable prevalence. There were high use patterns 1960 to 1975, but it is in our culture. That's phase one. So how do you define phase one? I call it informal enculturation, right? A new practice, a new state of consciousness becomes, moves into culture and a new context has already emerged, but that context is only weakly rational and not really evidence-based. So there are lots of people who tell all kinds of crazy stories about LSD experiences in the underground. The integration with scientific evidence is not very good. And now I'm speaking as an ethicist. The main point is phase one is suboptimal from an applied ethics perspective because the risk benefit ratio is very bad. And we have an ethical obligation, a political obligation also, to optimize the risk benefit ratio. And that we don't have. What we do have is normality in a descriptive sense. There's a normality that people drop acid all over the world, right? That's normal now. That's phase one. But it is suboptimal from an ethics perspective. So if you look at the phase, it's like the average age somebody takes LSD now is 20.1 years. Um, the illegal use is firmly established in culture. 
low stable prevalence, subcultural context is this, harm reduction is inefficient. And most importantly, society doesn't profit from the intrinsic value of these substances. Societies could profit more. The price is too high, the benefit is too low. Um, here you see the same thing. In the US you have more users, um, LSD is red. You see that the prevalence among people 21 to 64 years is 17%. So, what is phase two? The example of LSD again. Phase two has not yet begun. Nobody has legally taken LSD outside of a research context. The stable context is there, stable prevalence is there, but it is not enculturated. So phase two would mean enculturating the LSD experience, for instance, and this does not mean legalizing uh, LSD. What you do is, in the phase two protocol, you formally bring something into a culture by, by having a normatively defined cultural context, and then you optimize the risk-benefit ratio. That's formal enculturation, that's phase two. You have systematic and much more efficient harm reduction and you maximize the social cultural profit. For instance, in therapy, in sexualized spirituality, in cognitive enhancement, and so forth. Another important point is the distinction between consumer ethics and research ethics. Now I'm speaking as a philosopher, as an applied ethicist, most of you are researchers. The research ethics of psychedelic substances is ethically trivial. It's so simple and trivial that I will not talk about it. It's obvious researchers must simply have access to every single molecule when they need it and want to work on it. There's not much to be said about this. Um, everything else is political oppression. Consumer ethics is ethically much more complex. How should ordinary non-academic consumers have access to these substances? So we need a differentiated legal framework that formally constructs a cultural context, cons, sorry, context. And what I want to begin thinking about together with you today is the transition protocol. So what we need is a protocol to go from phase one into phase two that's based on ethical considerations, rational arguments, and empirical evidence. So phase two would be normalization in a normative sense, right? Here's another example. Abortion. I'll take the example of abortion in West Germany. Phase two beginning again on April 26, 1974. This is the paragraph 280. Phase one lasted for many centuries. Millions, many millions, but hundreds of thousands of women have died from abortions over centuries, right? There was a subcultural context for abortion. There was a practice, there was some knowledge. People were carrying out abortions and thousands and thousands of women died, right? Then, harm reduction evidence based enculturation happened in, on April 26, 1974, and you suddenly had a phase two for abortion as a practice. It was not legalization, it was enculturation through a very fine grained principle based process in Germany, the Indikationslösung. So there was principle based abortion, formal enculturation was normative, normatively defined, and suddenly you had an optimization of the global risk benefit ratio. I think this year in Germany, 96,000 women will have abortions about that number. Very few of them die. 
systematic and much more efficient harm reduction, and the psychological and social cultural price paid in phase one in centuries has been greatly minimized. We have a new legal framework, and there was a dynamic transition protocol that was triggered by these women, by a certain generation of women in Western Germany. So then you had normalization in a normative sense. So how do we get from phase one to phase two, maybe with psychedelics? The first thing I think we have to do is we have to face the facts. And a lot of problems in these discussions is that people do not want to face the facts. Again, I keep saying simple, the example of LSD. Almost all politicians have never taken LSD. The policymakers have no first person knowledge of the intrinsic value of those states of consciousness. Right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of the situation. Nobel Prize winners like Francis Crick, who you already saw, they take it. They have first person knowledge. Far less than 10% <coughs> of the general population in the world has ever taken LSD. So there's no first person knowledge in the general population. Almost no politicians have an interest in rational evidence based incorporation. That's a fact. Many know that it would be the right thing to do, but there's no career incentive whatsoever. It's different in different countries. In Germany, Germany is ruled by the car industry. The car industry has no interest in psychedelic experiments, right? So look at the general population. The general population, I would claim, does not even understand the need why there should be something like a rational evidence-based inculturation. The general population just does not care. And they have existing problems in this three-dimensional space with ethanol, caffeine, and nicotine, and they are in, these, in this narrow phenomenological space. So nobody really cares about what many of us in this room are interested in. So the fundamental problem is we have this research unit of neuroethics ethics in mind where we looked at this process for cognitive enhancers. How do you get from normality to normalization? It's a very complex social cultural process to get something that is already normal because millions of people do it overground, that it is social culturally normalized. And that is what I think the society, this newly founded foundation, should think about. And um, now I've heard in your talk that we need something like a combination of citizen science and professional ethics and something like a normative agenda for society as a whole. Philosophers like concepts, so I always take concepts as souvenirs back home. My favorite concept on this conference was psychedelic humanism. I really like this word, and uh, I picked it up in your lecture. So, how do you do the both science culture? You have the society has uh, formulated a vision, establishing the psychedelic experience as a tool for personal and societal development. That's the vision. Now, how do you get from a normative vision to political agenda, uh, agenda setting. I think that's my proposal. We need to develop a formal enculturation protocol to get this on the track and have a structured political process. And I will give you five building blocks for what I think how we should do it, and then my talk is over and we can discuss what you think, uh, what is missing in this. So let's begin with building block number one, which we would need for the classical psychedelic substances. That's probably the easiest thing. I think we should have a mental health pre-screening tool for all citizens in a free society who want to have these experiences. As far as I know, there are a lot of these risk screening uh, tools already. You just would have to be integrated in one standardized risk assessment for people who want to undergo these experiences legally that can be presented to politicians. Uh -huh. So I think 
building block one, harm reduction one would be creating a, a health pre-screening tool for risk carcinologies. I think the Mind Foundation should found a small scientific committee that is just dedicated to develop such a standardized pre-screening tool. I think that's like three weeks work given the existing um, building block number two. Now, if we want to get through in this very hostile social cultural environment in a difficult situation, I think we have to reduce complexity in the beginning, in the first ten years. Uh, and the first complexity reduction would be what classes of conscious states do we want to enculturate? Now here's my uh, proposal, we can discuss this. I would limit it to exactly only these four molecules, LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, 2 c This may be very idiosyncratic, I think for masculine the body load is a little bit too high, for the MT the rush is a little too steep, but maybe you have uh, other ideas, right? So, what the MIND Foundation would have to do is to form a scientific co committee that just decides on what molecules. Maybe a proposal could be, we just want to talk about one molecule in a public psilocybin period. Uh, maybe you want more. That, we need a scientific committee that limits complexity here. I think we have some 620 candidates. So, next building block, how many dosages for a free citizen in a free country? Here's my pro uh, proposal, two units per person per year. That's the proposal. A free citizen in a free society can legally obtain two dosages per year. Why that? I think that's a good base to argue on. Uh, and I also think that for serious people who are seriously interested in the therapeutic and spiritual processes, this is actually enough. Um, second thing we need is a structured timeline for the enculturation protocol itself. Proposal would be 10 years for phase two, just like a research project by the European Union, major review after five years, annual reports and systematic evaluation every year, starting in 2018 to 2022. So what would the Mind Foundation have to do? Found one small committee that settles on a timeline for acculturation phase two and decides on a number of dosages per year. Now the fourth building block is really a question from me to you. I'm very uncertain. Should we reduce complexity in space? Should we limit the possible locations where, say, the 82 million inhabitants of Germany can undergo psychedelic experiences? So the question I really have no answer to is where can the ordinary free citizen in a free society safely undergo psychedelic experiences? I think it's a human right uh, that the state offers this opportunity. So one option is everywhere in this country of citizenship. I don't know what you think. Another option is no special places, meditation centers, newly created institutions, exploratory. Another option is everywhere in the country, but only with a professional sitter. So the Mind Foundation would have to train a couple of hundred sitters uh, that could go uh, everywhere in the country. So what I would like this foundation to do is form a, com a committee that discusses complexity reduction one, two, three, and harm reduction, uh, and gets it into a short proposal. Now, last building block, my proposal to you is compulsory long-term care and occupational disablement insurance. Pflegeversicherung und Berufsunfähigkeitsversicherung. The idea is this society is not interested in it. Again, I know most of you are not realists. I like to face facts, right? So,
how does one limit the financial risk for society as a whole for phase two? And I think one does that if one introduces a mandatory additional insurance for everybody who wants to do this, and people have to pay it themselves. And insurance for psychiatric emergencies, necessity of long-term care, or occupational disablement. The advantage is, is that this argument in political discourse is out of the room. If you satisfy these conditions, and everybody would even pay their own insurance and pay their own financial risk to society, then it is clear that any opposition to that is purely ideological, right? That's uh, the important point. Now, if we had that, there would be a phase three after 10 years. At phase three, two things could happen. Even society takes, either society takes full responsibility for the new cultural context and says you don't have to pay these insurances anymore. Right? Or society says the experiment didn't work, we terminate phase two. The process is terminated. That's both of the options I see. So I think what the Mind Foundation should do is form a small insurance committee, talk to insurances, and organize a small insurance package. Um, so what have I been saying? I'm done. There is a wider context for modern drug politics. An ethical stance towards one's own mental states a systematic cultivation of valuable space, and a rational evidence-based and operation of psychedelic states. The second thing I said is that psychedelic research is relevant for philosophy of mind and cognitive science, and there's a lot happening, and there will be more happening in the future. I've given you five examples, the NCC, self-consciousness, naive realism, semantic hallucinations and so on. And then, I've taken some very first steps toward a realistic enculturation protocol, moving from phase one to phase two. I have proposed for your discussion and your active collaboration that we develop a standardized pre-screening tool, that we limit the number of substances to four, that we limit the individual dosages to two per year, uh, that I have no idea how we should limit locations, and that we should create a new insurance model. Now, at this point of our discussion, I think what is most important is a systematic to-do list, right? To get the process really going. And this is what I'm going to end on. Here is the to-do list, the homework for the mind foundation. <laughs> Add new building blocks to the enculturation protocol. I have proposed five. I guess you probably have a lot of better ideas. You probably have ideas why my building blocks were wrong, false, not a good idea, and maybe you have additional building blocks. Secondly, I think we should form scientific committees for each work package. We should integrate the results into a first draft, then circulate that draft, and have a final discussion workshop, I would say December 2007. <laughs> uh, we should finalize Enculturation Protocol 1.0 before the end of this year and then proceed to dissemination and agenda setting by perhaps publishing an official position paper of the Mind Foundation and then contacting media and policy makers. Thank you very much.
um,